goes out to all of the victims. If we have to go back to the drawing board, we'll go back to the drawing board. <laughs> we just got naked in the common room. Right. Hayden is going to learn about my ideal man. That sounds a bit gay, man. Alright, you ready? Three, two, one, go! For 365 days, I've kept a log of my life. What I spend my time doing, when and where I do it, and who I spend that time with. This is my video documentation for the small data science project I've formed around it. Okay, so here I can actually show you what this looks like. If I go onto Samsung Notes, I've got this little file titled WR. Originally, I used this file to record how many press-ups I'd done. So as you can see, you know, I, I didn't um, I didn't record the data very consistently throughout the uh, the file, and you know that's going to be a problem later on when I'm trying to get you know a program to read through the document. Now, a good question you may ask is why? I've always been a fan of recording things, so hopefully through analysis, I'm going to be able to learn where I spend my time who I spend it with, patterns in my behavior, and how external factors affect those patterns. So how are we gonna do this? I'm gonna need the help of my laptop in the creation of a program. And programming requires a language, and in this case, that language will be Python. Because of course, Python is the language used to conduct data analysis. And for the second reason, that Python is the only language that I know how to use. This first task was possibly the most disgusting thing I've ever had to do. Basically, I needed to establish some sort of form without the document. I wanted every instance of the same activity to be recorded in the same way, so that my code extracting the data wouldn't have to learn English to be able to know how to store that information. However, this process was incredibly tedious. There exists about three and a half thousand lines in this document. This clip rolled for about 40 minutes, and by the end, I had successfully formatted 74 out of those 3.5 thousand lines. Thankfully, as I got into the rhythm of the job, the rest of the document didn't take as long, and 16 hours, three minutes later, I had a fully formatted set of data. Now, it's possible I went a little insane during that time, because I thought up a rather strange system for the program. So here's a typical entry I'd make into my phone after going out to a friend's house. Yep, there's a lot of information there. I always wanted to smash in whatever details I could. Obviously, I was a little obsessive. I had to decide what information was important to recognize, and those key elements were who, what, when, and where. Highlighting respectively in red, blue, green, and yellow, we can see that this information is spread absolutely everywhere, except for when, because thankfully, I had a system down for that one early on. To solve this, I designed each entry to fundamentally revolve around the what, and I rearranged it like so. Now the who and the where function as additional optional information that can follow the what. The program will know whether it's taking who data, as it will see the word with, it will know when it's taking where data, when it sees any of the words at, in, to, etc. But now I want to be able to assign a length of time to each activity. That's easy for these entries, where there's only one activity in the time frame. But this time frame here, contains multiple. I need to be able to tell my program roughly what share of the whole duration each activity occupied. Because say for example, if I had in one time frame walked to St. Stephen's Cathedral, which is a church in Austria one and a half thousand kilometers away, and then pray to Muhammad, like one would be obviously taking up a lot more time than the other. So first off, I'm gonna start separating activities in a way that lets the program know for sure there's a separation, because currently the full stops have that job. But if the program were to read the name St. Stephen's, it would register Stevens as the start of a new activity. Therefore, I've got to use a marking which I know won't randomly pop up throughout my entries. And for this, I can implement the semicolon, because we all know I'm far too illiterate to be splashing that thing around in my sentences. Now, as we said, we wanted a way to tell the program how long each activity in the time frame lasted. I thought that if we added a little marking like this, the program could be constructed to interpret that as a time mark, assigning 10 minutes from the whole duration pool to that specific activity. Why bother mentioning the T? Well, let's go back to the previous example where I've now added this formatting. Some of the time markings are shown in T and some are shown in W. This is because for some activities, my estimations of the time were better represented as proportions of the whole duration instead of definite amounts of minutes. And the W stands for waiting. After the time frame has allocated discrete amounts of time to the activities marked with time marks, it then calculates how much time in the duration is left. It can then distribute the remaining time to the remaining activities according to waiting. By default, the waiting should be 1, 
but I know of an activity took up proportionally less time than another. I will adjust its weighting to represent this. I really hope that made sense, but if it didn't, that's alright. All you need to know is that it works. Now one final thing I wanted to add to the system to make my life just a little bit easier was a second parameter in each semicolon statement. At the start of the time frame here, you can see that I took the bus to St. Mary's with Jay. I actually spent the entire time slot with Jay, but currently only four activities reflect this. I could add with clauses to every single activity and add Jay to make sure it knows I was always with him, but this seemed like such a primitive solution. Instead, I can first initially mention Jay in the first activity. Then, if I wanted an activity to maintain the same piece people from the previous one, I add a little e in the second parameter of the semicolon statement, and bam, it knows I keep the same people. But I had to be careful using this method, because I'm telling it to keep everyone from the last activity, when sometimes I only want a few. In this case, I conceded to just adding in the specific people again. Similarly, if I want to maintain the place information for subsequent activities, I can add an l. If I want to maintain both the people and the place, I can add a p. Okay, that sums up most of what I had to consider whilst formatting the data, but I haven't yet even moved on to the- I'll be brief for those who don't code and just want to see the results. Taking an object-oriented approach to the program very much helped me think about the interactions, about the different concepts embedded in the data. For reference, this is my lame class diagram. The whole operation worked under a single for loop reading the file line by line. When it saw a date, it would instantiate a new day object. When it saw a time range, it would instantiate a new instance of time slot, which would be underneath the current day. Time slot would then create instances of activity based off the number of semicolon separators in the time range. Also assigning these activities to the day and giving them a duration based off the semicolon parameters. And finally, each activity would go through its portion of text, figuring out what was going on who was involved and where it was taking place. It would then link up to instances of those people and places, instantiating them itself if they didn't already exist. Each person and place object would contain a set of activities that they were referenced from, which could be iterated over to provide the amount of time I spent with that person or at that place over the course of the year. Needless to say, I, I did run into some strange occurrences whilst coding. Over the course of the year, I entered the names of a lot of distinct people into my log, but I estimated that the number would never cross like 250. However, on one of my earlier run-throughs, I got a very different result. So, I've just finished drafting up the script, and it's telling me with this number right here that I've mentioned 798 people in this log. And one of them is called Stillborn. So, a bit of work to do. Thankfully, after thickening up the code, I patched up on a lot of the bugs that were coming through. Honestly, the complexity level of the program was not, it was, it was, it was quite low. By the time I'd implemented most of the functionality, I was clocking in a little over 300 lines of code, which is, is really not that much. I was quite excited to get to the results, but I still had a few problems to get through. Okay, I've done a little more work. And now, if we get it to display people, we're going to be able to see that there's only 368 people, which is, is, is better. Still probably not the right number. And as I scroll up, you can see the lovely people in my life and how long I've spent with them in minutes. But something tells me that these values aren't exactly correct. Because as I start scrolling up, things get a little, a little strange. I've got my friend Josh, of course, but who could forget? Reading Josh, Kitchen Ed, Dad, Broad Street Mall Mum, which is supposedly a person I've spent 39.5 minutes with. Outside Mum, as opposed to inside Mum. It's now night time because that's actually when you're supposed to do computer science. At last, we can finally see some stats. First up, I've got our three categories ranked from most time spent doing to least time spent doing. Unless it's people, in which case it's most time spent with to least time spent with because I didn't spend any time doing anyone. So the categories are activities, which are the things I do, places, which are the locations I go, and people, which are the individuals I do things with. I'm going to start with places because it's probably the most scuffed. Ranking in at number one by over a thousand hours is school. Now obviously I probably spent more time at home than I do at school, but the problem is that I wouldn't log that, and I don't even mind that lapse in data. If I, if I were just sat on my phone writing down every second I was at home, 
there'd be no time to leave the house. Now, funnily enough, the uh, the second, fifth, seventh, and 11th are all gyms which uh, I guess kind of makes sense because honestly what where else do you go like to consistently spend your time now I'm actually curious do you like have any specific places that would like consistently pop up because like after this it, it really does just fall off like all of these places are just like places I spent like one day at and then never again moving on we've got our top tier list of people I get this probably won't mean much to anyone else but it's interesting to see the order of my friends come ranking in maybe it's sad my uh my family come in lower than my friends but it also makes sense because i wasn't i wasn't counting the time i was just like chilling at home uh, with them in the house all right now finally we've got activities so over the course of the year i engaged in reportedly 63 different activities to give you an idea of what kind of things those activities were this number is including but not limited to walking running cycling taking public transport missing public transport programming writing composing filming editing playing saxophone playing piano playing video games doing push at gym doing pull at the gym doing legs at the gym doing abs at the gym cooking Cleaning, revising, reading, let's go, let's go. visiting, watching, waiting, sleeping, attempting to sleeping, lying in bed, eating, chilling, calling. You get the idea. Now this was probably the best kept data in terms of reliability since, as I explained, the data is built around the activity. So let's check out that ranking. Obviously taking that number one spot is uh, sleeping, and I did 2,757 hours of it, which is an average of seven and a half hours a night. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's too bad, is it? Leave a dislike if you get more sleep than me. Next up, we've got school, which is listed as both an activity and a place. I'm actually a little surprised about the proportion of school to sleeping, but I guess that, that can also be explained by the fact that I started the log at the start of last summer and it's nearing the end of this summer now. So really it's counting a year plus another summer, but like, I mean, like the title, like 365 days plus another summer just it didn't roll as well so i'm sorry i i clickbaited you and i'm a pretty chill guy or at least uh at least i did a good 350 hours of chilling what this means is just time spent hanging out with my friends not not doing anything in particular just talking or joking around now bed is actually such an important stat i often find myself waking up on weekends or holidays and just wasting away the uh the rest of the morning lying on my in bed on my phone this is that that's 107 hours. I'm not getting back. Isn't that tragic? There's definitely a lesson here. I'm sure I'll learn it soon. A lot of the uh, the lower activities here are, are pretty pointless. Like, I spent I spent five minutes panicking this year. Isn't that great? You'll be pleased to hear I spent at least 56 minutes showering. Finally, I got the program to write the data into a CSV file, which I imported into our best friend, Google Sheets. This allows us to visualize the data using line charts in both cumulative time and the weekly time. Unlike the rankings the program output in Python, these graphs display how the time I spent with each object changed over the course of the year. This sheet here includes only the activities, and if I zoom out, we can, we can see sleep and and school's imposing figure. Looking at this red school line now, we can we can actually see, obviously these tiny bumps here are gonna be the weekends and the longer ones, longer flat lines are gonna represent the term breaks. We can now see the weekly reports throughout the year for each activity. Again, there's a lot of noise sitting at the bottom here, but peeking out, we can see our constant stream of sleep and even more obvious now, our school figure. The term breaks have been made even more clear, but we've lost the weekend. So we can see summer break, October half term, winter break, February half term, Easter break, uh, May half term, and then we've got summer break again. Now I just want to pick out specific patterns I can see through the data. Quite an obvious one, but the grouping of the activities, editing, filming, and writing always came in clusters. The process is usually, you know, write and then film and then edit. And I was hoping to see that, but unfortunately I suppose the flow just didn't get to a up here. As to what specific projects these spikes actually represent, I believe this is apology video right here, and this right here is the video you're watching right now. These crumbs of time scattered around the first half of the year here are just random records of exercise that I do at home. But obviously I only began going to an actual gym at the start of March, so I've been pretty consistent since, excluding this heartbreaking lapse in the past week here. I'm at least proud that 
collectively, uh, practicing my, both my instruments outweighs gaming uh, this year. But quite honestly, this was probably the lowest year for both. My gaming spikes were kept distinct and infrequent throughout the year. I would only be hopping on for a little session on, on a group call, maybe at most once a month, it seems. Hate to be big time in these activities, but priorities have definitely changed since I was in year nine. That said, this fattish lump of piano here was my best effort at keeping my house alive and breathing during house music back in May. As you can tell by my non-existent participation in music since, I, I did not succeed. Focusing on work, the lovely pattern you can see emerging from this graph is my revision levels spiking at the end of each term. Interestingly, these two terms right here don't follow the pattern and they are actually around the same period where I was getting my worst marks. The people graph is less extraordinary. Generally, everyone flows up the mostly constant rays and there aren't any breakout contenders or upsets during the timeline. The weekly set is pandemonium, but I suppose isolating some groups can highlight some synchronized bumps. This is obviously when we're spending time together as a group. We can see this even more more clearly with the, the family. Wrapping this up, the only places of significance apart from school were gyms, and acting as a summation of these graphs, we can look back to the activity of exercising. The reason these red spikes aren't showing in the bottom graph here is that I was at this leisure centre for badminton, not working out. Now what's cool about these gym graphs is that you can actually follow them along with a time lapse of mirror selfies. Yo, why is that a shirtless boy on your screen? No, Oh damn! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that's that's right. The, the computer science shirt's pretty good at hiding it. I'm just kidding. That that whole time lapse was photoshopped. I've actually never been to a gym in my life. This is actually what I look like.